So welcome to everybody to today's interview, uh, SESI Talks. You know that this series of interviews is being made in the frame of a larger project, which is called WEP24, which aims also at, how could I say, sensitizing citizens, but also especially our, our members to the importance of the upcoming European elections, but also speaking about the benefits, but honestly also about the flaws of the European Union. Today, it's a particularly honor to be able to agree to welcome Evelyn Regner from Austria, member of the European Parliament, vice president of the European Parliament of the SD group, and as vice president, also, of course, responsible for contacts with social partners. Dear Mrs. Regner, dear Evelyn, welcome. Uh, I say, I uh, wish an excellent good afternoon. Great to be here with you. Uh, Evelyn, a lot has been, I mean, the European Parliament has been the center of, of how could I say, a particular attention at the beginning of the year, the end of last year, and it was not something really ne necessarily positive. It was the so-called Qatar gate. Um, what, what should happen now, according to you, your vice president of the European Parliament, what that these things, I mean, there's never 100% security uh, or safety, but that these things which shed, to my mind, very unfortunately, a rather bad light on the European Parliament do not happen. It's definitely an attack on uh, European democracy as such. Yeah, I don't want to uh, paint it in an, in another color than as it is. It's dark. Um, the European Parliament is amongst European uh, institutions by far the most transparent. And I just say that that was also before the whole thing started. It's the most transparent and we're an open house. Democracy should be always open and transparent. And what happened, and this is very important to say, uh, is something uh, which shows that the European Parliament, though the whole story is so terrible, incredible and sad, that the European Parliament is working, yeah? We reacted very quickly, excluding uh, those being concerned, the vice president, uh, excluding from the tasks, I mean, really enabling everything uh, that, the, uh, 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 that the courts can work. And this is of utmost importance because when we have to do all the best concerning transparency measures and controls on the one hand, but on the other hand, as we would like to keep the house an open house, uh, we uh, can't avoid at the end of the day, if there is real bad criminal energy, you can't avoid that. And this is important to say, because of course we're doing the utmost that the transparency is improved. And this is right now what I say as a vice president, but also as a a member who is fighting for uh, stronger uh, transparency rules for, for really a long while, that's the good news. Because all the things I wanted already uh, that they get improved uh, for a couple of years are right now on the table. And this is a good thing, which means uh, the access rules that are sharpened right now. So who can access the European Parliament again? The house should be open. We are elected and we would like to talk to those who give an input, but we should look very carefully who it is and how the access is controlled. And this will be uh, sharpened. And the same with the control, uh, as the implementation, really the control. Strengthening of the transparency register. So somehow uh, those loopholes that are existing to also here to control better who is uh, uh, registered. I just tell you one thing when I'm meeting, we have as uh, members the obligation um, to, uh, to, to, to write whom you're meeting. And of course, this is something also good. I mean, that's something I'm meeting trade unions, I'm meeting uh, experts, I'm meeting scientists, I'm meeting uh, industrial lobbyists because I would like to know what's happening outside and who is giving an input but you should document that. And we have already rules, so I'm doing that, uh, as also uh, many others, but many, many haven't simply uh, followed those rules. So what, what we introduce now is uh, 
uh, a better implementation, enforcement of the rules that are already existing, and of course also sanctions. And the sanctions are done by the uh, President of the European Parliament, so that it's uh, it's about money, it's about not really uh, being uh, uh, able to represent your, uh, to live your democratic rights. So somehow there are uh, means to do that. So somehow uh, what we're doing right now is uh, strengthening these rules. And of course, I mean, there is there are a couple of things I would like to have even tougher, which uh, so far are not uh, done, but uh, it's an ongoing discussion. For example, when you're invited to to, uh, to, to, to go to an institution, to go to, to a university and so on, that this is always carried by the member itself. So far we have transparency rules, you should show that if you're invited by the University of Oxford and that is paid, so somehow you should do that uh, in a transparent way, I think we should also pay that ourselves, but this is uh, details in this uh, context. So basically more transparency, stronger yes. sanctions. Um, more seamless application of the rules and yet uh, not jeopardizing the access, the openness, and as you said yourself, the closeness um, to citizens that would, of course, be a, a pity for the European Parliament. We are, you mentioned that you are... Uh, sorry, sorry, I would like to add one thing, because this is also important. Uh, this is really a scandal that shows we have good rules, but the rules should be implement, in, implemented and enforced uh, uh, in a better way. So we have the transparency register. We have really a couple of tools which are excellent. But on the other side, and therefore I'm just uh, uh, adding that too, uh, we should strengthen the uh, application also by these rules of the commission and above all by the council. You don't see those who are in the dark. And the lobbies contact the same way we know that. The representatives of the member states in the council, so they are in contact with national governments, with those do, doing uh, the whole uh, legislative work in the European context. And here we don't have no, we don't have any rules. So somehow you can't say something that is happening, sort of a scandal or whatever, about those in the dark. And in order to be credible and really uh, democratic in a good way, legislators, it is, it is absolutely necessary that the same rules being, applied, being enforced, being implemented and really being seen are also uh, done in the council. Yeah, I, I, can't, I couldn't agree more, especially that for us, what ha whatever happens at the council is is uh, subject very often, too often, to some kind of package deals where you don't know actually why um, a certain member state took the decision or voted in such way or another. Even as an observer, as an outside observer, the council remains extremely, extremely opaque, to put it that way. So, so we would also certainly welcome a revision of these um, uh, interinstitutional agreement. Uh, I think that that could be also one of the one of the priorities, if I understood it correctly. Um, Evelyn, you were mentioned also, you, you're a trade unionist yourself, and um, I mean, a lot has been done. The European Commission also came up with two proposals to, to strengthen uh, the social dialogue. Now, if we speak of uh, collective bargaining, social dialogue, or democracy at work, what is, what is the role of social partners uh, for the promotion, let's say, of the social acquis, but also the well-being, sustainability, and competitiveness, maybe, um, of societies as a whole? How, how do you see it both as a politician and as a, uh, I could, I think I could say a full-hearted trade unionist? Um, from a democratic standpoint, you can only say um, strengthening of social partners means strengthening the democracy as such. Because what trade unions are doing, what workers uh, organizations are doing on the one side in the enterprises and on the more general level, and of course also at the uh, side of the employers, employers organizations, this is democracy at work. I mean, democracy should take place at schools. It should take place in, in the societal life. It should take place uh, when we're talking about, uh, I mean, wh what politics are doing. And I mean, people are working. And democracy at the workplace 
is one of the most important ele elements of the whole democracy in, in our society, in our member states, in the European Union. So strengthening the social dialogue means therefore always strengthening also the European institutions and strengthening the, uh, the, the, the social dialogue in the European context is nothing else but a strong tool in order to uh, have, uh, uh, have a strong democracy as such. So when we're looking at the situation, at the percent of, percentage of organization of people in their trade unions and how those developments are, when they're getting worse, whole democracy is doing uh, uh, worse. And when they are getting up, whole democracy is doing better. And therefore, it's important to strengthen all those instruments from funds, from projects, and then, of course, legal instruments in order to go on with our European democracy. I mean, it's so difficult and it's so easy. We have the... Um, we have right now the, uh, the 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 national work that has to be done uh, uh, concerning the implementation of the minimum wage. Yeah, and here there is a lot of of strengthening of the collective agreements and the collect uh, and the partners uh, of the social dialogue in there. So this uh, just this this is already an important instrument that has been strengthened. Uh, in the last legislative period. And then, of course, we also have the European Works Councils. And as we see, there is the, the last resolution of the European Parliament. There is an instrument in hand. I mean, we'll see uh, what happens. There is not so much time left until the end of the legislative period. Uh, but uh, I see the willingness of uh, Commissar uh, Schmidt, uh, who hopefully, by sure, takes the time left in order to strengthen uh, also the democracy of the European Works Councils. So the whole sexual dialogue and, of course, also social partner agreements are absolutely important tools uh, that are in hands uh, of the social partners uh, to, to, to strengthen democracy. And, our, uh, and the European Parliament, of course, is always a partner in the background uh, to say, OK, if you don't come to... Uh, uh, to an agreement, we are there, so that shouldn't be an excuse of not doing anything. I mean, you, you said it uh, yourself, it was so difficult. It can be so difficult, it can be so easy. Um, gender equality is so close to your heart, uh, and also you've been extremely, uh, how could I say, active and committed in these past years. And if you think of um, the Women on Boards Directive or trans Pay Transparency, and the recent also... Um, um, resolution of the European Parliament uh, related to this um, horizontal anti-discrimination directive. The European Parliament gender uh, equality, um, what is the importance here of the policies of the European Parliament, maybe specifically, but also of the entire EU? I mean, uh, we have in the European, I mean, we can say the following thing, past years, the progress that is done concerning gender equality in the European member countries is due to the work that has been done at the European level. Looking at most member states, what's happening at the national level, we can say we're dealing with strong backlash. We're dealing with the facts. I mean, post-corona, uh, the economic situation, I mean, uh, we're dealing um, uh, with uh, the consequences of war, also rising of uh, uh, violence. And on the other side, there is this strong European answer. We never ever had so many legislative proposals than in this legislative period. I mean, uh, we are just ahead of the uh, pay transparency being implemented also by the council who never ever wanted it. So somehow there is a strong, strong push. And this is really coming from a strong and good cooperation between the European Commission and the European Parliament who wanted it so much. And the trade unions who said, Commission President, whatever you're doing in this, in this legislative period, gender equality is a social issue. Gender equality is an issue of justice. Gender equality is deeply, deeply European. And so we have the care package. We are negotiating uh, 
measures uh, against violence against women, Istanbul Convention about being uh, also ratified by the European uh, Union, Women on Boards Directive. We are just having a vast field of legisl le legislative measures that is done right now and anti-discrimination. So if the commissioner can push this also and the time is running, then we really have a boost of uh, improvement of gender equality by the European institutions. And I just say that normally we were dealing with minimum standards and most member countries have a higher level. But in this case, this will be an improvement for most member states. And this is really a big, big thing. So something to communicate outside. And of course, it has to go on because the society has changed. We need a, a, a diverse society, an equal society, and gender equality is a uh, a major step and therefore uh, it's very important also from the, I would say, from the trade union uh, perspective. I can only uh, confirm what you have been saying and the responses and the initiatives of the European Union have been quite impressive. I have to, to agree with you. Uh, Evelyn, coming to the European semester, it's something which is always very far from the citizens and from the members um, at the same time is a quite fundamental importance when it comes to to the coordination of um, economic and, and fiscal policies, um, which has been criticized in the past for either being not, not really respected by member states or having a too strong, how could I say, liberal uh, uh, orientation. What has happened since uh, Corona? Or maybe uh, how can we make this cycle of economic coordination more so true? I mean, it remains difficult. This is something I have to say. Uh, of course, uh, we should have uh, a new stability and growth pact. We see uh, as the consequences as we have uh, uh, in the post-corona time and now with the crisis, uh, with the energy crisis due to the Russian uh, aggression and uh, invasion, the war in the Ukraine by Putin, we see there is no invisible hand that works we need market regulation. We just see that very clearly that the market has to be regulated. Financial markets should be also uh, uh, regulated in a strong way. We just see that right now with the Credit Suisse, uh, what happened. So who is paying? Taxpayers are always those paying. And who is that? That's the workers. That's those being in the enterpri uh, enterprises working in the supermarkets and the hospitals who are really in the, 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 the work that should be uh, rewarded in an appropriate way. And all those are always paying the perverse uh, 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 reactions uh, that are happening at the system as we have it right now and the capital market union, the banking union, still is not completed. So there is a way to go to take the whole picture. So the, 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 the fiscal, the economic governance, so the, the fiscal policy, but also uh, the whole pictures on how uh, we are doing economic policy. So a long way to go. Evelyn, maybe a last question also to you specifically in your capacity as a vice president of the European Parliament. We started with the, with the discussion, uh, speaking about the Qatar gate and the impacts also on the EU, but specifically on the European Parliament. Now we look at the year 2024 with the upcoming European elections. Um, in your capacity as Vice President, would you, what are your fears and what are, or let's say, worries and what are your hopes? Yes, my, my uh, I mean, there, from my point of view, there's a clear message uh, uh, um, that I, I mean, there is a clear way to go. We see, of course, there is this uh, rise uh, of anti-democratic, uh, extremely right-wing parties uh, playing with the fear of people, the fear of having not a secure uh, future uh, about social security above all. Can I afford a good life? Can my children afford a good life? And therefore the answer of the European Union can only be strengthening the social architecture, strengthening the social pillar 
to be really the fundament of the uh, European Union. Uh, people want to be able to afford their living. People want to be able to pay their rent, to pay their uh, gas and energy prices. And this needs joint, united, very well coordinated answers of the European Union. We have those elements and they have to be done. Otherwise, people are going in their desperation to the extreme political positions. This can't be the answer of the European Union. So uh, the social union, the social Europe will be key. Uh, to quote one of your uh, colleagues in the European Parliament with whom I had the honor also to, to have an interview recently, he said, to save social Europe means saving Europe as a whole. And exactly. Evelyn, thank you very much for your time. All the best to you uh, for the coming years and of course beyond that. And I look forward to seeing you very soon again. See you soon, bye-bye. Thank you very much. And thank you for having had the occasion to have this exchange with you. So looking forward to, to the next time. So thanks See a lot. You. Thanks a lot, yeah.